Uh, so I teach at San Francisco State. Our union is the California Faculty Association. So I want to describe how it operates so that you know what not to do. And I want to contrast that with the Chicago Teachers Union, which does do a fabulous job. But I want to uh, conclude with one little criticism of the Chicago Teachers Union and just mention what happened with the Teamsters back in the 90s as a kind of a contrast. But let me just uh, begin by mentioning that back in the 1980s, the labor, top labor officials began to say the strike is obsolete. And so they were promoting this partnership with the bosses, as it were, and in addition to electing Democrats to office. And uh, we've seen the results of that strategy. Our standard of living has continually, continually dropped since then. So the strike is, of course, our most uh, important weapon. In any case, so the California Faculty Association is spread over the 23 campus, 23 campus CSU system. And we're a part of SEIU. So, um, at, so here at San Francisco State, we have about a thousand members. And again, it, it, this is not what you want to do. We we have an e-board that has, I think, twelve positions. It could have many more, but people aren't interested in being on it. Uh, so we have about six or eight people at each meeting, and um, uh, we we never post our minutes, so nobody knows what we what we do. We have we pass resolutions occasionally, but we don't tell our membership about them. And so they don't know about it. So they know <coughs> virtually nothing of what we do. Um, we have membership meetings twice a year where you know we call on the full membership to come. So we have 1,000 members, roughly. And out of that 1,000 members, oh, 20, 25 people come to the membership meetings. So uh, it's, it's a, a horrible turnout. Uh, at these meetings, a statewide officer, so we're just San Francisco State, but somebody from the statewide leadership comes to our campus and they talk to us for about 45 minutes and they have a PowerPoint uh, presentation and then we're invited to ask questions. So we don't make any decisions, they don't ask for our input, uh, and usually the same people don't come back a second time to these meetings. So we get a new, fresh 20 to 25 people at the next meeting. In any case, so, oh, and then we don't give any reports to our members about what happened at this membership meeting. So the other 99%, they don't know anything about what happened. So, uh, but usually that's, nothing happens, so that's <coughs> not a big loss. But in any case, despite all of this, um, uh, last fall, this past fall, our membership voted to strike because we have been so abused financially with respect to our salaries uh, in the CSU system. So people voted to strike and you know, 84% turnout. I, I assume that is a correct number. I was a little bit surprised at that. Usually I ask them, how many people voted when we have a vote? And they say, we won't, we won't tell you. Mm -hmm. They refuse to tell because of course it reveals their weakness. Uh, and so, so they won't tell us. In any case, so here, People voted to strike, so we had to have we had to start organizing picket lines. But we couldn't get enough people to volunteer to be on a picket line to close down the campus. Fortunately for us, uh, the um, the um, uh, us, our union and the, the CSU came to a tentative agreement, saving us from the horrible um, uh, debacle of having a miserably staffed picket line, and so. Uh, and so we came out with a tentative agreement that people eventually voted, voted on. Uh, let's see, in fact, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll say a little bit more, more about that <coughs> in a minute. So in any case, uh, uh, our union statewide has two major assemblies a year, and these are the big decision-making bodies. But the assemblies are organized so that uh, most of the most of what happens is like a dog and pony show, you know. People come in and talk to you. Experts come in and talk to you. A Democratic Party member comes in and gives a keynote speech. And then, so the the amount of time that's left for this for the the members to actually uh, give their input into how to run the uh, what decisions should be made becomes minuscule. Like the last time I went, it was like the last half of the last half of the day. And, and so it was just, and, oh, and then the speaker said, oh, 
we're going to have to cut each speaker down to one minute because mm -hmm. <laughs> so, we otherwise we won't have enough time for enough. In any case, so um, uh, so d uh, decisions as a result are seldom made at these meetings. Now, w back in 2010, I did take in a resolution to uh, 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 tax the rich in order to. Um, it's five minutes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> no questions yet. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, I took a resolution to tax the rich. It did get passed. They forgot to post it on our website. And uh, when it came to s supporting the millionaire's tax, which the California Federation of Teachers initiated, my union refused to support it. So uh, that's a whole other story. In any case, look at the last thing to say about this statewide thing, and that, that I, I just want to then go on to the Chicago Teachers Union is that at our last meeting where our, our statewide president came in, she said, we could never get a dues increase if the membership voted on it. And that just shows you the contempt. It's the mindset of contempt for the membership. Mm -hmm. As if, see, they never tell us how they spend the money. You know, so, <laughs> so of course people wouldn't want to wouldn't want uh, vote to increase something that you don't know, where there's no accountability, there's no transparency. But if they laid out how the money was being spent, and it was being spent in a good way, then of course people would vote for a, a dues increase. But the, the whole mindset is, don't trust the members to make okay. decisions, and uh, we'll just have to make a, uh, and we, we won't tell them what we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and that, so that's their strategy. Many unions, I think, operate this way. Okay, so um, in any case, um, oh, last thing is, when, they, uh, when we got a tentative agreement last fall, the union came in and lied about it. Three? <laughs> uh, they lied about it to get it passed. And I won't go into the details, but I've seen that happen before in other unions, where they just lie to the membership about what they got. In any case, so in contrast, you've got the Chicago Teachers Union. They started off with issue committees where people could volunteer for a certain <coughs> issue committee, and that issue committee was the uh, committee that generated the demand that they took into negotiations. So the membership had a big role right from the beginning. They were, they were making important decisions. Um, they educated their members. They uh, um, uh, instilled their members with the sense that they could win. Uh, they were constantly transmitting information to their members, but also soliciting feedback from the members so that they were constantly adjusting their, their approach according to the desires of the members. Um, they, uh, of course, made big alliances with the community. Uh, when they were involved in negotiations, they informed their members every step of the way of exactly what was going on. In my union, when we were involved, they would send out announcements like, uh, we made an offer, they made a counter to offer, and then we discussed it. You know, as if they were saying something, giving us some content. So, uh, it, so th then they continued their strike in 2012, two extra days, so that the delegates could go to the members, get their feedback on this tentative agreement, and then they uh, and then they voted to uh, accept it. In any case, so in all of that, you've got, of course, you've got a big sense of solidarity. You know, when the members have the voice in forming decisions, when they discuss and debate the issues, in that process, you begin to get a sense of community, you begin to uh, depend on, trust one another, you begin to rely on one another, and it, you know, you, you two were mentioning that it's this whole new dynamic, a whole new culture begins to take hold the union, and you can do a whole lot with that. Now, just one, uh, one minute, really quickly. The Chicago Teachers Union, in my opinion, they made one mistake, and that was to support a Democrat for mayor against Rahm Emanuel. Of course, you'd think anybody's better than Rahm Emanuel. But the Democrat, like a Democrat does, came out with uh, things like, um, uh, he, you know, and Rahm Emanuel closed 50 schools that and angered the whole, whole community. He was, this candidate was only gonna reopen a few of them. Then, he said, uh, Emanuel uh, cut the teachers' pensions this candidate said, well, I won't cut him until we have a dialogue. So, I mean, so that, was a, that was a huge waste. So, um, and they put, poured in a lot of money and effort to this guy, and he lost, uh, and deservedly so. Um, uh, that, that might be going too far. In any case, but just to, 
contrast that with the Teamsters Union, I might take a minute or two extra. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, it's that uh, in 1994, uh, the Teamsters had a contract with UPS, and UPS unilaterally broke the contract and said, we're going to lift the limit on how much we require you to lift to 150 pounds from 70 pounds. And uh, Ron Carey was head of the Teamsters then, he said, uh, uh, well, let's talk about this. Because uh, they had already agreed on 70. It was in the contract. So they said, uh, UPS said, no, we're not going to talk about it. We're just going to do it. And so uh, at that point, Robert Reich stepped in and he said, I'm prepared to mediate. And Ron Carey said, no, thanks. We'll, we'll take care of it. So he had just immediately called the, uh, called the workers on strike. Uh, the um, UPS went out and got a court injunction against them. And they, um, uh, and Carey ignored the court injunction. They kept on with the strike, and within 24 hours, UPS capitulated. Mm -hmm. So that, you rely on your members, not the politicians. <laughs> Let me just go one more step. And that is, uh, in 1997, Ron Carey went on to win this incredible strike against UPS. They promoted the part-timers, first and foremost, but they won big gains for everybody. Immediately afterwards, the Clinton administration accused <coughs> Kerry of financial improprieties. They t removed him from office. They told him he could never run for office again. They put him on trial for financial irregularities, and he was judged innocent. And they never rescinded his uh, restrictions from running for office again. So the, the whole issue was, he, he, his real crime, of course, was he won this incredible strike, and um, uh, and um, uh, but um, so the whole moral is: you don't count on the courts, you don't count on the Democrats, you don't count on the politicians, but you count on your membership. That's your strongest base. And when you when you build up that that fighting community of spirit, where you're all trusting one another, relying on one another, and fighting together. You begin to inspire everybody, and workers all over the map. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can make big changes in that direction. And that, again, just going along with what you two were saying, on whether to go out on strike or not. Now, what I meant to say more clearly was in the past, they haven't told us how many people voted. But it was only this time that they did tell us how many, what percentage of the membership voted. And of the 84% who, who did vote, I think it was over 90% said we want to strike. So that was that. But in many, every time this has happened in the past, I say, what percentage of the membership voted? And they say, we don't, we don't give out that information. <coughs> the, the, the people who work for the union. The, the, the leadership of the union, yes, uh, thank you. And then with respect to, I also said that they lied when it came to uh, presenting the tentative agreement to the membership, and they told two lies. See, we asked for a 5% raise during the first year of the contract we were negotiating. Well, what they did was they accepted a 5% raise at the end of the first year. And then they came in and told us, we got what we asked for. Well, there's a big difference between 5% raise at the beginning of the year and 5% raise at the end of the year because there's been 2% inflation <laughs> between the beginning and the end. So the 5% at the end of the year really amounts to a 3% raise. But they didn't say that. Okay, so that was line number. They said, we, we got what we asked for. That was wrong. The second thing was, and this was really disgusting, is they said, if you don't vote in favor of this tentative agreement, you must go on strike. Well, back in the 90s, we were fighting off merit pay. And I was on a campaign, many were with me, where we campaigned against accepting a contract with merit pay. We succeeded in getting it voted down on just about all the 23 campuses. And they went, that, and we did vote down the tentative agreement, and that simply forced them back to the negotiating table, and we got rid of merit pay. So there was, the second lie was, if we didn't vote yes on this tentative agreement, we had to strike. No, the, the other alternative is they can go back to the <coughs> negotiating table and we can get more that way. So it was, uh, uh, those were the two um, misrepresentations. Okay, so I have, um, let's see, uh, um, is Joel Jordan, so why don't you take it away. So I'm gonna talk about a, a unique statewide effort that involves getting out of what I would call the 
the bargaining box that K through 12 or really early childhood ed through adult ed locals in California face increasingly. Um, and an effort that is a work in progress, has some problems I'll talk about, and uh, but that I think is very much worth getting behind and certainly knowing about because most people don't know about it. Um, just to start to set the context, if you look at collective bargaining for these locals in California, um, 90% of the funding that comes to locals comes from the state. 10% comes from the government. Very little comes from local sources, except if there is a partial tax, which usually only wealthy districts pass. Um, not only wealthy districts, but it's a small amount anyways. But 90% roughly comes from the state. And what we've seen since the Great Depression of 2007-8 is that, and even with the, the, um, the proposition, prop, I wanna say Prop 50, 55, 55 that passed, that uh, was a great proposition and then it raised taxes on the rich, really didn't even bring these, these districts back to where they were before the recession. So that's one problem, that, that the locals, when they go into bargaining, face limitations set by the state. That's number one. I will call that the first box. The second box, which I would argue in line with what, what especially what Ann talked about, is, is what the leadership is like on the state level in the teachers' unions. If you look at the, 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 the CTA, California Teachers Association, which is by far the biggest of the two, there's also the California, California Federation of Teachers, they prioritize inside baseball, dealing with the governor on the inside, no organizing on the outside, no organized pressure from the membership, no coordinated actions between locals in order to pressure for more funding or anything else. And that it means that the 300,000 members of CTA are limited in their strength because their efforts to the extent that they, they are involved in, in anything, it's usually local contract work, which as I said, has limits in terms of what you can win. Lower class size, for instance, which is expensive, forget about it, or forget about substantial lower class size um, uh, if you only rely on local negotiations. And then comes now the third box. For the last 10, 15 years, we've seen uh, mostly, uh, we've seen the rise of the charter school industry for the last 10, 15 years, which threatens and weakens uh, local bargaining power by draining already scarce resources, even more so because what happens is like in urban areas, which these uh, charter schools are growing in most, uh, where they're focused on and concentrated on, especially in, in communities, uh, low income communities of color, you find that like in LA, 16% of students that would have gone to LA USD schools are going to charter schools, going to independent charter schools. 20% um, or so in Oakland, going to charter schools, 12% in San Diego and I could go on and on. We're seeing, it, and this develops a crisis, a budget crisis for these locals because the locals, the local districts have fixed costs. They have administrative costs, teacher costs, um, uh, maintenance costs, building costs, which are, which are fixed, and then, but the funding is, is determined by student enrollment, by ADA. So that causes a crisis. Um, and then here again, <coughs> um, the rules over charter schools that are, were set by the 1992 contract, uh, car charter school law, make it very difficult for school boards to actually, uh, to actually turn down a charter school. The criteria that they use makes it very difficult. And even when they do, the charter schools can go to the county boards of education and the state boards of education to get approval, which they do. There have been some highly publicized cases where that has happened. Both these local entities turn them down, they go to the state and get approved. Um, <coughs> and then we come back again to the problem with the, with the CTA, primarily the CTA leadership, which because of its orientation hasn't really educated the members around charter schools, hasn't really developed an organizing plan around the, the, the growth of these privately run charter schools. By the way, I just wanna make clear, there are like 400 what are called affiliated dependent charter schools in California that are union, that are public, that are controlled by the districts that these are called affiliated or dependent charter schools, but most charter schools, three quarters to 80% of the charter schools are privately run and privately controlled even though they're publicly funded. <coughs> so, um, so what have we seen again with, with the CTA? Um, they've done very little because they wanna have cultivate an alliance with Governor Brown who's very pro-charter as are a growing number of 
Democratic Party politicians elected with the money from the California Charter Schools Association, which is funded by the billionaires. And <coughs> so the power of the charter school lobby in Sacramento and locally has been growing. So what to do about this? This, in, this represents an enormous challenge for uh, local, uh, local unions, local K through 12 unions. <coughs> in the fall of 2015, UTLA, which represents 32,000 members, elected a, um, uh, elected a, uh, a, a uh, social justice organizing leadership, um, which decided uh, after it had, had negotiated a successful contract and organized a successful contract, but still wasn't able to get anywhere near what it really wants to get in terms of, of fighting for the schools uh, LA students deserve, decided that they needed to develop a statewide strategy. And what they did is they got together with, first with the two locals that have the most charter school, the highest percentage of charter schools in the state, and that's Oakland, San Diego, along with UTLA. And those three locals came together to decide, to, to try to strategize, and over the time, uh, there were a number of other locals that came onto the table, San Francisco, Richmond, San Jose, San Bernardino, and Anaheim. Three strategic priorities came out of that, came out of those discussions. The first one is that we weren't going to be able to stop the charter school train um, by lawsuits like was done in the state of Washington. The state of Washington had eight charter schools at the time. The Supreme Court ruled against charter schools to, put them to, uh, to, to slow them down. Actually, they, they found another way to get back in in, in the state. But um, they only had eight. Just to give you some idea, there are almost 1,000 charter schools in, in Los Angeles, California uh, enrolling over 450,000 students. So this train is, uh, has been going on for a long time. It's developing huge momentum. It's up for five or 12, five. 10 or 12? Mm -hmm. 12. OK, right. Yeah. Uh, and it has huge momentum. It'll take bottom-up strategy, bottom-up strategy to organize against that. Um, second, we agree that to address the issue of charter school expansion, you had to link it to the question of improving the public schools that exist. Um, especially those in low-income communities, those are the communities that are targeted by charter schools. Um, be, uh, and why are they targeted? Because those schools have been the product of historical neglect and underfunding by the traditional public school system. This means that um, this coalition is part of the statewide effort to reform Prop 13, to develop a split role property tax, which would tax commercial property called Make It Fair, uh, supporting the creation of community schools, which provide wraparound services and other uh, additional services to, to help students. Um, I'll, I'll pass around later on a, the platform of this, of, of the alliance. Uh, it's called the Alliance for uh, Community Schools. And um, uh, supports the providing resources for restorative justice programs that address the school to prison pipeline and more. Um, and we believe that not only is this linking strategy necessary to win public support, but it's also necessary to mobilize our own members because our members don't yet see, it's not just a matter of education, that certainly needs to be a, go on, but our members tend to be motivated around what's going on at their school and, what, and that involves the contract. So what we, what we wanted to do was to link contract fights around their schools with the privatization, and we'll get to that in a second. So, um, and finally we decided that, that this effort that we were engaged in needed to be independent of CTA and CEFT. That it needed to be an autonomous movement that was consisted of the locals involved plus community organizations, parents and students uh, from those locals that would be involved to drive this effort. At the same time we recognized that we were going to need at some point to push the, the, the affiliates understanding the weaknesses and bureaucratic nature of their leaderships to push them in a direction that further than they would be willing to go. So going into the summer of 2016, we still were without an organizing strategy until we realized that five out of the eight locals that were at this table, including the, most, the biggest ones in the state, San Diego, UTLA, San Francisco, Oakland, <coughs> and San Bernardino, that their contracts expire at the same time. July of 2017, and we thought, aha, that was an aha moment to think, yes, now what we can begin to do is create 
the, the, the conditions for mutual support, solidarity, five point strategy, which might take me a little bit, a little bit longer. We'll give you a couple more minutes. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. One was each local had to build its own kick ass contract campaign for its local contract. But included in that contract would be not only demands around class size that maybe you couldn't win at the local level, but also demands around charter school that, that get toward the question of charter school expansion. So for instance, a demand that the district, um, the district uh, fund a, uh, an impact study on the uh, educational and financial impact of charter school expansion on the district. A key thing to do in order to provide the research basis for going after charter school expansion. The, uh, second, <coughs> the second was to support these demands with coordinated action statewide because they would, as these locals engage in through their bargaining process, we would have coordinated demonstrations, petitions, all kinds, rallies and so forth at the same time in order to highlight not only the local bargaining demands but also the state demands. And then the third, third was to focus our energy as well on the state. That is first around bills being proposed in the legislature. We were able, this table was able to force or pressure the CTA to go much further than they have uh, the, the bills that they had sponsored. Okay. Um, so, as, I'm, as a member of the executive board of UESF, I'm, I, I was approached actually about the alliance. It's interesting to hear it's trying to be independent of CFT because the first time I was formally approached around it was with my president and a member of CFT talking about the alliance and saying, well, what do you think this thing should sound like? Um, so that's why it's kind of interesting to hear this. I'm not saying it's not independent, but it's strange to hear about it. You're saying the, the alliance, oh, you heard about it where? Uh, well, I heard about it from my president, and then later my president and a member of CFT was the one kind of talking to me about what they would want. The same alliance? Uh, well, I, maybe it wasn't clear. That's but true. there is okay. a CFT alliance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so maybe that's what that was. Um, I will just say it's, it's been confusing to understand. Like what I, what I understand what this body was ultimately about was saying we do see we're linked up in terms of end of our contract dates, what can we do in common? I think what I anticipated hearing was what are some of the common contractual demands that we might have, class size, um, how do we deal with the inclusion model, uh, paraprofessionals and their low pay and their, the kinds of work conditions they face. Right. So we'll just identify some key common areas that I might, that I, this is what I expected to kind of hear in terms of, um, and then to say these are demands that we are commonly making to our, all our respective districts and this is the strike date we're setting to all go out if we don't see. <coughs> now, I would have thought it would be in August, but if it's February 2018, which to me seems late, but it's just a common date. And um, now what I hear is sort of like, well, we're gonna leave it up to your locals. Well, here's the, here what I, I think is some of the problems is because I know that CFT, CTA, and AFT have their hands deep in to our bargaining team and our president and our vice president. So they're, they're largely determining the strategy that our locals are having. So if you try to be independent of them, they're gonna scuttle every, they're gonna basically scuttle anything that puts pressure on them, except to reach an agreement. So, uh, totally right, um, so I, I'm, I'm both saying I understand your problem, but I also wanna hold you accountable to that problem, because I think the only way you can then run that is to basically hold each other, not to, oh, you all get to locally organize, you'd have to hold each other to demand and to a strike date that you were commonly set. And basically commit to doing that and tell your membership this is the date we're setting. So we all better get ready for this date. Um, so that's kind of what I anticipated. If you knew you were fighting that body, the only way you were gonna CFT is CTA. The only way you're gonna do it is, to, is for all of you to commit to a date and do it and then force the rest of the state to come with you because that's what, so that's why I'm, I'm not sure what you were thinking because you knew they were gonna come in and basically be in the heads of all our president and vice president uh, because they get to talk to them every day because they hire people to do that. <coughs> Make some moves because it's at three o'clock is when we're gonna be going into the proposal planning. Okay, so Joel. Okay, so um, Kristen raised the issue of what, what's, uh, what's gone down in UTR and uh, I kind of agree with you. I mean, I, I think that if the president handled it that way, it was, it was wrong. It shouldn't have been handled that way. It should have been brought to the uh, was it your executive, your um, rep council? Mm -hmm. It should have been brought there. I don't know if it's still being planned to be, uh, it's still gonna be brought there, but um, I think, um, you know, what is he, 26 years old? I mean, he's like an inexperienced guy, and uh, and he comes out of a sort of a questionable past. So I 
totally get your point here. That doesn't mean I think that the that the that the you know the project is statewide is is wrong. It's just that the way in which it was implemented in that local sounds like it was mistaken. And hopefully, something better can come out of it there. I hope so. Uh, the second is there's some more there's more political issues raised here than that I think Steve raises, and I don't know your name. Yeah. Yeah, raised. And that's the question of whether you try to, how you try to reform charter schools, or whether you do it all, or you just go after stopping them, like, for instance, that statewide repeal thing that Steve talked about, which I did oppose, and I'll tell you why. Um, in order to have taken, to take on the charter school industry, you have to have an organized base, and there has to be um, there, there has to be a base of organizing for you to stop them. And that initiative was done not with that in mind. And my view was it would have been gone down to terrible defeat, and it would have been a, a setback for the movement to stop charter schools, number one. <laughs> number two, I think, look, at, I, I'm a socialist. I believe, I believe that, that we have wage slavery. Does that mean I'm against higher wages? I'm for those reforms even though I'm against the concept of wages. We have to fight for reforms that, that will strengthen people's resolve to fight. That's what we're about, that's what organizers do. And we can't start with the end point, we have to start with where people are willing to be organized around what they see as reasonable, what they can fight for, and then to, to move the, to move the, the um, uh, relationship of forces accordingly. And so I don't think that you can start out with ending it. I mean, I'm sorry, it's just not the way organizing works. If you're involved in organizing, we have to start with, with public control over, over public funds. And that means accountability for charter schools. Now that means, I mean, even the motion in Richmond, which was not to get rid of charter schools, it was to stop their, it was to call a moratorium on them. In fact, it didn't even call for ending them. It, it's a moratorium, you know, a moratorium could be for a year and then you could start up again. Yeah. So, you know, that, I'm just saying that that, with that motion assumed was what I'm talking about, is you can't start at the end point. You've got to get there. And the question is how to get there, it seems to me, is to fight for public control over, over that. So, for instance, take the, take the demand for local control over authorization. That now makes it possible for boards to turn them down, much more so than they did before. That's, that is a reform worth fighting for. Of a moratorium reform, which by the way is, on, is in the hopper in Sacramento, that's worth fighting for. And I think that's not different from what the Richmond Resolution said, so there's that. Okay, and I, I think that's an important strategic discussion to have, is how you go about making change. The, the, the last thing I wanted to say is about uh, your, the, what's your name? Andy. Andy, and, and, uh, Andy Lipson. Andy, yeah, Andy. Um, <coughs> my view, I, I've been working a bit with UESF folks for the last, um, since I moved up here, and, um, um, you know, with the EDU folks, some of the EDU, or formal EDU folks, since it seems to be not in great shape, <laughs> not in great shape. Um, and it seems to me that what has to happen there, I agree with you, that in that local, especially in that local, the executive, it isn't just the CTA and the CFT, it's the executive board majority, which I know you're on it, you would know that better than me, is dead set on basically settling a contract and, you know, we want a contract and we want it now. That was a big chant at the demonstration in San Francisco. No, we don't want it now. We want to build up so that you can get a, you possibly go on strike for something better and something coordinated. So I think that the you know organizing at the base at the rep council level, at the rep assembly level or your assembly level, to get around your executive board to place specific contract demands, uh, which I understand you don't even have a salary demand. That's amazing to me, not not to go into negotiations without salary demand. Joel, can you start wrapping up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what I what I'm saying is I think that the. What has to be done in San Francisco is an end around, and it has to be from the bottom up. There's no other way to do it. There's no other way to stop the CTA and CFT influence, but it's, from what I gather, it's the executive board majority that's really the problem there. Okay, all right, so.